the end what remains uh, the text is going along with the um things i'm doing with the olivet discourse and revelation mark 13 18, 18 through 20 this is Joshua speaking. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning, when Elohim created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the sovereign had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. Father, indeed, I, I pray along with Elder Gary as far as the meditations of my heart. I pray that you would put them through your filter today and that those that are hearing might simply hear what the Spirit says to the assembly. Amen. In those discourses, uh, Luke 19, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Yahshua's description of judgment and wrath of the Almighty, it troubles us. It troubles all believers that a God of boundless love could also carry out the punishment of the wicked. Now, that's a confusing paradox. The idea that the Anointed One came first to compassionately save and heal, yet will return here to cast many into torment. It's unacceptable to the modern mind. Shouldn't Yahshua's return be exclusively good news? But Yahshua's words are bad news. He foretells of national and social disasters, of persecutions, and the falling away of the faithful, of temptations and trials, of general disorder and turmoil, tribulation, sorrow, hardship, disease, misery, and death. Besides predictions of local upheaval, like the destruction of the temple, Yahshua leads us on to envision disaster of global and almost universal proportions when we think about wars in heaven, etc. He warns us then in Matthew 24, 29 in the Olivet, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall away from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Cos cosmic uh, occurrences might bring on uh, matchless fear in the world and panic, um, lawlessness, as predicted in Luke 21, another Olivet passage. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars on the earth. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Well, that's a pretty good prediction when it comes to terror, because that is one thing that has many of us shaking today. All these mysterious events are seen by Yahshua as Elohim's wrath as indicated in Luke 21, 23. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. Now, wrath is an old-time word. It comes from the Greek word chorge, which means violent, passionate anger or vengeance. Our Elohim is not simply a concept by which we measure our pain, as John Lennon sang in a song that was so popular back in the 70s. But he's a real person. He's intelligent, emotional, passionate, loving, but also vengeful when it comes to paying back the evil humanity that is perpetrated against the creation and his children. As the writer of the Hebrews emphasizes, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. Hebrews 10.31. In Yahshua's seven end-time parables, found in Matthew 24 and 25, four refer explicitly to the punishment of the wicked. For the wicked there will be mourning and weeping, 
gnashing of teeth in anguish, cursing, casting out from the presence of Messiah, taking away, a throwing away into the fire. If Yahshua is telling the truth, the Father's judgment upon lost humanity will be frightening and everlasting, and the gentle Yahshua will be the agent of such wrath as he comes. If our idea of Yahshua ben Yahweh, or Yahshua Shabbat, is limited to the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, in the manger in Bethlehem, such words of judgment will, will shock and dismay. They can't help to. We are long to deny this facet of Yahshua's character and mission. Yet because of our distorted myths of Christmas, most people only understand Yahshua as some kind of miracle child grown into a charismatic sissy in Hollywood. Worldlings certainly will never celebrate a Yahshua who is the agent in their judgment. When the time comes, all will be expecting some kind of Santa Claus with his eight tiny reindeers. But instead, they will meet Yahweh Saviot with his myriads of avenging saints and angels, according to the Revelation. In the words of hymn writer Charles Wesley, those who sat at naught and sold him, pierced and nailed him to the tree. Every eye shall behold him, robed in dreadful majesty. We who are serious in the faith, we need to rediscover some vital to the faith that the image of Yahshua, the meek child king who came to save, is not incompatible with the image of Yahshua, the master of hosts or armies, who will come to avenge. The Jewish theologian, perhaps you've heard of Avraham Heschel, he may have best expressed the compatibility of the two images of Elohim, that of a meek sufferer and of a strong tormentor. Heschel believed that Elohim is moved and affected by what happens in this world and that Elohim reacts accordingly. In the biblical view, man's deeds may move him, affect him, grieve him, or on the other hand, gladden and please him. I hope he's pleased with our offering today. This notion that Elohim can be intimately affected, that he possesses not merely intelligence and will, but also affection, defines the consciousness of Elohim. What Heschel is saying is that who we are and what we do every day has a significant effect on Elohim's feelings and actions. Now that is remarkable. Though we know that the Father is a person and that he feels for us, it doesn't mean that he is human. Elohim is not a man. You make him human and attempts to understand him but he is not. Yet it's obvious to us that the Creator chooses to live in a relationship to that which He created. The Father is sympathetic to His creation. Like a good mother, He is sympathetic to our needs. And like a good father, He will rebuke and chasten. And there I go, trying to understand it as though it were human indeed. It is not. But how else will we understand unless we build us an anthropocentric model? Most parents suffer when their children are ill. I had a occurrence yesterday. I was driving the car down the street here to go to uh, the store, and in the middle of the road was a child and his mother in the middle of the road standing and talking, and I slowed up and stopped. And the woman was saying something to me, and I rolled down my window to find out what, and I found that she was cursing me with filthy language, saying to me, uh, expletive, expletive, 
what are you doing here? Well, where was I supposed to be? I thought she probably should curse herself if she was going to curse and, and ask herself, what am I doing here in the middle of the road with a toddler? I still don't know, but she screamed at me all the way when I went past, all the way down the street. Now, going back, in the days when my daughter, Gina, was born, she suffered serious allergies. I was up with her the first two nights in a row that she came home from the hospital, rocking her, singing to her. I fell asleep a few times singing. Oh, I loved her so. I didn't know what was wrong with her, only that it seemed her little life was in jeopardy, and it was, as it turned out. And though I didn't feel the exquisite pain of the newborn, I still suffered greatly on account of her suffering. As her co-creator, I was sympathetic to my girl's distress, and I was distressed. She survived. Six years later, Gina decided that she'd throw a fit in the middle of church to get my attention. When we got home, I took her to her room and soundly spanked her fanny, letting her know exactly why she was receiving that punishment. And though she's acted up in many ways many times since then, well, she's 41 years old. It was the very last time she acted up in church. As a father, I tried to be sympathetic to Gina's need for correction, but it was hard because I kept thinking of that baby dying in my arms a few years before. And likewise, the father sympathetically suffers with his children, as any loving father should. He also appropriately chastises them, as a loving father should. He reacts and he responds to all people. But because people are emotionally and perceptively limited, people experience the father's reaction to their needs as either the affection of love or the affection of anger. Whether the father expressed love or anger, both are expressed not out of disdain, but out of affection. He doesn't get angry when he chastises you, but he does that also because he loves you. But discovering what we perceive as an angry God brings us to another difficulty pertaining to judgment. Professor Conyers, in his great book, The End, relates that a student in his theology class had a complaint. Kevin, he stood up and he said, I have a problem with the idea of God's anger. When I think anger, he continued, I think of someone who's out of control. That's not what I want to believe about God. It would make life so uncertain. Uh, this is a common objection to the idea that Father would get angry. We as humans interpret wrath through our experience as humans. Human love and wrath can be unbridled. Human love and wrath can go way too far. It can be unjust, can be fickle, can be abusive, can be murderous. Human anger, when unchecked, kills the body, destroys the spirit of both innocent and guilty. Everyone listening has been victimized in one way or another by human emotion, and everyone listening today is also victimized through emotion. Again, the solution to the problem of divine wrath is in understanding the Father that he is not a man. We call him him out of convention only. He has traits common with both male and female humans. I had this lady in church back in 95. She couldn't get this concept. She was sure that God was a man like an old man on a throne on another planet known as heaven. Her background was Mormon. Now she was in her 50s, and that image from Mormon Sunday school kept with her. But you see, her own father was an old man with a beard who sat on a rocking chair and got up to beat her. 
His ways are higher than our ways, fathers and Elohims. We can't understand this kind of fervor that seems to be anger. We can't understand that because through our human experience, because he's not human. The Bible consistently presses that view that though people are unjust, there is justice in all his ways. When this dear lady realized that Elohim was not a man like her father, she was freed up. And soon after that, we went to the Brownsville Revival together, and she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, something that she'd wanted for years and years. I think what held her back was her concept of the angry God. See, uh, though the Creator's not a man, he, she, it can be just in both his favor and his wrath, for he is absolutely, perfectly personal and absolutely, perfectly perfect, unlike any human. He sets the standard for perfection. Whatever he is, that is perfect. Yet the Creator is devoid of anything impersonal. He's not like that Gnostic God that sits way, way above all things that go on, and nobody can contact them unless they can find their way through the evil world and get up to heaven. He's not impersonal. He's intimately involved in all the affairs of our lives, and it is completely in control of itself. Therefore, he, she, its justice and mercy are perfect because it addresses each need from a standpoint of knowing everything there is to know about each situation and implying, applying the perfect response. Uh, this is called beneficent omniscience, if you're a term maven. And our Elohim couldn't very well love us if he didn't hate the sin that brings us to harm and death. Yes, to revert back to anthropocentric language, the Father in heaven is perfectly sympathetic and answers the need for justice from an eternal perspective. Elie Wiesel. I'm sure that you've heard of him, perhaps read some of his books or columns. Elie Wiesel spent World War II in a concentration camp. I want to warn you, this story is very, very illustrative, but it's also very sad. He talks about, in his memoirs, three men who were condemned by Nazis to hang. Two were accused of hoarding arms. The third, a young boy much loved in the camp, refused under torture to give information. The three were made to stand on chairs with ropes around their necks. The boy was between the two men. He was light of body and very frightened. The inmates were lined up in rows, forced to watch the show. The chairs were kicked out from under the victims. The two adults, who were heavier, they died quickly. But the boy writhed at the end of the tether in anguish, suffocating slowly, choking. And as he was dying, somebody muttered, Where is Elohim? Where is Elohim? No one answered, not even the rabbi. Later, as the prisoners were being led away, the question was asked again, where is Elohim now? Wiesel heard the answer within him. Where is he? Here he is. He is hanging here on the gallows. In the person of the boy, the suffering Yashu was once again hanging between two thieves. The father suffers sympathetically with his children who are suffering. They say that Elohim forsook him. I don't believe that for a minute. He's reciting Psalm 22, and when he gets to the end of the psalm, he finds that he is not alone. For 
Elohim comforts his own because he's intimately acquainted with their suffering and affliction. And let me tell you, when you suffer, no matter how small the suffering, Elohim suffers with you. That's why he sent his son. But does this experience of Father also apply to sin and evil? If so, wouldn't we experience the comfort of his presence and the sting of his wrath in our lives? Both. If we take the wrong road, doesn't it make sense that the Father would try to set us aright? If he is indeed absolutely perfectly personal. Well, this setting aright could seem like an ordeal to us, but from his perspective, he's only putting you back, back on the path with his little finger. For we are never alone. We are never on our own. Big Daddy is not only watching, but is intimately involved in our doings. We need to remember this. We are always in relationship with him, whether we like it or not, whether we want to or not, whether that relationship is good or bad, we don't need to go seeking for him or for being disappointed in our own behavior. He knows everything that's going on in our lives to the most minute detail. Wrath refers to just one side of that relationship. It, too, is an experience of the Father's love. When we stubbornly refuse his love and care out of rebellion, disobedience, backsliding, then we may expect to experience his love, as we understand, wrath. We get spanked, and hopefully we get rehabilitated. When do we become perfect? Well. Wesley was asked that question because he taught Christian perfection. He said, I became perfect, mm, I think I was 82 or 83. <laughs> That's what I think. Uh, I can believe he was perfect having read his biography and his journals. But 82 or 83, I'll never get there. It, every time I seem to get on a plateau, I stumble and fall, but one thing for sure, there's never a time he's forsaken me out of my own sin, but rather that's when he comes in all the stronger. Notice that the Father's judgment is rife in the teachings of Yahshua. It's not arbitrary or purposeless. You know, I teach partial preterism and I believe that the Olivet was completed in the book of Revelation and that most of that is past. So we see uh, the culmination of Yahweh's wrath on Jerusalem in that war in 70 AD. But his wrath is perfectly precise and focused, and it focuses on the end of that age, or if we believe in, as a futurist, the end of of the age or the end of the world. <laughs> Yahshua tells us that in the calamities to come, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Sometimes that means unto death. Furthermore, he said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come, Matthew 24, 14. What the end refers to is uncertain, unless, unless we look at the epistle of Barnabas, then we know what he's talking about. That he's not talking about the end of history. He's not talking about the end of the world. He's not talking about the end of the United States, and he is not talking about the end of our experience with Elohim. Clearly, Yahshua is speaking of the end of evil. Barnabas tells us this succinctly. The finishing of all things that oppose the Creator, defile the earth, undermine the perfect purpose of our Elohim for humanity, 
and all the cosmos. For when Yahshua comes a third time, he will bring an end to the agents of war, disease, crime, revenge, hatred, decay, envy, lust. Judgment, then, is about the end, the end of all evil, the end of all corruption, the end of the wicked one and his wicked ones, the end of death, the end of hell. And I'm looking forward to the end of those things. Are not you? The good news is that we have assurance that the things that should last will last. All that Yahshua taught and stood for will last. All that the Father meant for his children to be will last. And if he says that we'll never die, then we can expect in our next appearance to be unto perfection ourselves with no more self-disappointment, no more worry for death or disease, but we will be working in his kingdom. And heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Mark 13, 31. Go and read the last two chapters of Revelation. In my teachings on this, I, I'm teaching the historical viewpoint. I'm not making any claim to knowing what the future is. I am not uh, a psychic. If you want to know what will last, though, you can find that there, Revelation 19.20. For the word and all the goodness he stands for was willed in the beginning, the culmination of a 7,000 year period, not much known before that, not much known after that, only that a perfected world will be handed over to the Father on the eighth day. And it is this word of love and fellowship and assurance that Yahshua proclaims. That is the good news. It will endure when all else is burned up on the burning trash heap. To believe in the Father's judgment is to believe that all that is good will prevail and that evil will finally be totally overcome. And that's what I believe. This is what the end is all about. It's a good thing. Without judgment, the Father's love fades into indifference. What have we to fear? What have we to doubt? Are we not leaning on those everlasting arms? Let's think about our personal feelings. Where do you stand when it comes to the end of evil? Will the evil of evil spell the end of you? If you think not, have you taken into account the saying, None are righteous, no, not one. Brother, sister, look, you still need a Savior. Say, I got saved. Oh, yeah? Have you been saved from the wrath of Yahweh? Well, we certainly have hope. But in the meantime, we need to cling to and to abide in that Savior, Yahshua HaMashiach. The Savior you need is the one you'll eventually stand before. None other will do. You must accept no substitutes. For when I stand at the judgment seat of Yah, and he shows me his plan for me, the plan of my life as it might have been had he had his way, and I see how I blocked him here. I checked him there, and I would not yield my will. Will there be grief in my Savior's eyes? Grief, though he loves me still? He would have me rich, and I stand there poor, stripped of all but his grace, while memory runs like a hunted thing down the paths I can't retrace. Then my desolate heart will well nigh break when the tears that I cannot shed, I shall cover my face with my empty hands. I shall bow my uncrowned head. Let us pray. Yah, of the years that are left to me, I give them to thy hand. 
take me and break me. Mold me now to the pattern that thou hast planned. Amen. Amen. Has it? When the ark <clears throat> rested, Moshe said, Return, O Yah, to the ten thousand thousands of Israel. We pray together. Avinu shoba shamaim yit kadash shimka viyit barek malkutka retsonka yihiyi asui ha shamaim uvarets viditain lakmenu tiredit umikal lanu kitutenu ka asher anaknu mokalim lokotim lanu vial tevinu Lide Nisayon Vishamrenu Mikalra Yamain. Our Father in the sky, may your name be sanctified. May your reign be blessed. Your will be done in the sky and land. Continue with us, like give us our bread. Forgive us our sin debts as we forgive the debt of those who sin against us. Do not bring us into the nets of a snare and protect us from the evil one. Amen. Amen.